Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll begin by reiterating the problem statement to identify the important parts. Uh, so an array of mousetraps and ping pong balls results in a chain reaction. Um, we're asked to construct a model for the macroscopic dynamics of the system, identifying all the relevant parameters and to determine the spatial temporal behavior of mousetrap excitation probability and the threshold mousetrap density for the chain reaction to occur. Um, so the first part we'll do, we'll focus on this to construct a model. Um, so we begin by considering what such an array of mousetraps would look like, right? So we have a grid um, on which we have all the mousetraps. And we say that a mousetrap has a trigger probability when it is hit, so on this surface, of P trigger. Um, then we go and make a slight simplification, which is that if one of these squares is hit, um, then the probability that the mousetrap itself is hit is given by the, the ratio of these two areas. So the area of the mousetrap divided by the area of the grid. Um, so then the probability of a ball landing in a square, uh, the probability that, that triggers that mousetrap is given by basically the product of these two probabilities, which is listed here. Or, which is important, zero if it was already triggered. Next up, we want to consider what happens when it is triggered. So once a mousetrap is triggered, it launches a ball. Um, and we assume, this is another simplification, that it has a constant launch velocity. Um, we assume that this ball is launched in a random direction with an angle theta, which we assume to be given by a normal distribution which with a given um, standard deviation. Uh, and here, W0 is um, a normalization factor such that it integrates to one. And the angle phi, which is the horizontal angle, um, is assumed to be completely random for now. Um, then we consider what happens once it is launched. Um, so here we make another assumption where we ignore air resistance and we compute the distance traveled by this ping pong ball. And obviously for ping pong balls, air resistance is important, but in our model, we've decided to exclude it. Um, so here, essentially the travel distance, um, pretty easy problem. It's uh, two times the vertical velocity divided by the gravitational acceleration, which gives us the, the time that the ball is in the air. And we multiply it with the horizontal velocity. Um, and then we can write it in terms of theta, like so. Um, this results in an impact position, which is then given by this phi from before. Um, so d is the travel distance. And um, basically, x0 and y0 here are the position where it was launched from, and D and phi are as before, right? So then we consider the bounces. What happens when a ball hits the ground? Um, so each ball that hits the ground is assumed to bounce. During a bounce, the ball loses a portion of only its vertical kinetic energy, but not its horizontal kinetic energy. Um, we assume that this is given by an energy loss coefficient, which we call rho. And then the kinetic energy changes like so, and the horizontal kinetic energy remains constant. And this results in the change in velocity to be given by, for the vertical velocity, the square root of one, one minus rho. And for the horizontal velocity, it's the same. Um, a ball which does not trigger a mousetrap is assumed to continue in the same direction, whereas a ball that does trigger a mousetrap is assumed to continue in a random direction, um, but with the same velocities as before. So the ball is not given any energy by hitting another mousetrap. Um, we also consider a ball as rolling if it doesn't reach a vertical height, which we call h roll. Um, and then this corresponds to a vertical velocity of v roll, which you can calculate, square root of 2 times g times h. Um, and it's assumed that the rolling ball does not trigger any mousetraps. Now, to the motivation behind this, um, Essentially, we think the mousetraps have a certain height and the ball can only trigger the mousetrap if it can reach the top of the mousetrap, not only the side. So in that sense, um, that's why we made this assumption this way, that that's the termination condition for a ball, because then it can't actually roll onto the mousetrap. Um, so a little summary here to bind this all together. So if a mousetrap here is triggered, it is shot in a random direction as stated before, and then it can bounce, right? And then with some probability, it can trigger 
another mouse trap, and then it will continue in a random direction and continue to bounce until this rolling condition is satisfied. And it produces a new ball, which again continues in a random direction um, with the initial velocity v launch. Um, part of the question asked us to determine the critical density. Um, so essentially, we want to first determine the expected amount of balls that are triggered by each ball. So this is referred to as an R number, and I'm sure with the activities of the past year with COVID, everyone's become more than aware of what this means. Um, essentially, what it means is if R is greater than one, then we can have a chain reaction because each ball triggers more balls. Subsequently, if it's less than one, the chain reaction will die down. So if N is the number of bounces that a ball makes before it terminates, then this R number is given by the trigger probability, so the probability, um, the overall probability that it triggers a mousetrap when landing in the square, multiplied by N. So we have to note that this implicitly assumes that the bounces are independent events, which isn't always correct, because if the bounces become smaller, then this can cause issues because we could double count events. Um, but we'll get to that later. Um, so then we have this termination condition, as stated before, that the vertical velocity is less than the rolling velocity. And essentially, this gives us this um, expression here. So this 1 minus rho square root to the power of n. Um, and then if we substitute this, we can rearrange it to a condition for n, the amount of bounces. Um, so we compute here. Um, essentially, we rearrange this for n, this equation here. Um, here, we've assumed vy to be approximately v launch. And this is. Um, if the standard deviation is small, it's quite correct because um, if it's 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, then Vy is usually around 99% of the um, initial velocity. So um, we can rearrange this condition and we can find an expression for n here. Uh, and subsequently, we can substitute this in and we can get an expression for r. Um, and here we've rearranged this and we've written this in terms of S, which is the separation distance rather than the area. Um, but in principle, we can also write this as a density by dividing the area of the mousetraps by, sorry, the area of the mousetrap by the area of the, um, of the separation distance, the critical separation distance. And then we can get this expression, which gives us the critical density. Um, next. We say that this is likely to overestimate the critical density, right? Because we have um, in our model we have a finite map size, and we have the possibility of double counting as, counting as mentioned before. So we could correct for this by determining the remaining bounce distance um, and saying when this reduces below the separation size, so that all the remaining bounces will only hit one square, then we want to terminate. Um, and we can rearrange this condition again. I'll, I'll leave it out because the derivation is a little longer. Um, but we can rearrange this to find a, another critical density. Um, so then we did a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, here we have some arbitrary parameters. Um, and we, um, in this case, we had a separation distance of 10 centimeters, and you can see a clear chain reaction that occurs. Um, here we've used discretized time steps, um, which is another um, simplification. But in the case of small standard deviation, quite valid because all the bounce times, um, all the um, time that the ball is in the air is approximately the same because this is given by v launch times the cosine, so two times v launch times the cosine of the angle divided by g, and the cosine of a small angle is approximately one. Um, so we did this for many, and you can see here for all of these we have chain reactions occurring, but above eighteen this does not occur. Um, this is, this is quite inefficient to actually determine the critical density. So instead, we took a different approach, which is that we also considered the number of active balls. And we took the maximum of the number of active balls. And then you use this to compute, because this is the point where the R number is equal to 1. And we use this to compute an effective density of the map and use this to determine the trigger probability. Um, and then we can, exactly as this states. And, um, we then did this and we found that this was 18 approximately. Um, and our previous um, critical density actually was 22. So this was an overestimation. Um, and then we have some possible extensions such as direction dependent launch velocity, um, which you can see here that it slightly launches in one direction. 
But um, for higher velocities, we saw some problems with this. So it's possible that there's an error somewhere in the code. Um, and the other option is reflecting walls. Um, that's another option that we could discuss. Um, All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, hello, everybody. My name is Jose Betancourt. I'm, I'm going to be the um, opponent for the problem nuclear mousetraps. Uh, so, let's have a quick recap of the problem. Uh, are the main aspects that we wanted to be taken into account in the problem. Uh, first of all, they wanted us to construct a model for the microscopic dynamics of such a system, uh, identify all relevant parameters, uh, determine spatial temporal behavior of the mousetrap excitation probability, um, and determine the threshold mousetrap density for the chain reaction to occur. So first of all, I would like to thank the reporter to, uh, for uh, a presentation that was really interesting in terms of visualization and uh, analyzing what happens with the phenomenon and the theoretical aspects that were considered. Um, so let's uh, have a quick uh, summary of the points brought up by the, uh, in the solution of the reporter. Uh, first, they constructed a, a model defining a trigger probability um, and a hit probability, which we consider to be uh, very interesting and very appropriate for the mo uh, model we're analyzing, um, based on geometric parameters. Um, we had a, they, they had a normal distribution on the angles and a constant velocity in the uh, in the uh, in their assumptions. Um, they considered energy loss, which we consider to be an, an important factor in the uh, in the stabilization of the phenomenon as well. Um, uh, they used the yard number to calculate the critical density, which we consider to be a pretty interesting theoretical approach. Uh, and they considered the uh, the bounces as independent events, uh, and they use uh, the density. They use an expression for density based on the uh, percentage of area covered by the mousetrap. Um, they also corrected for overestimation in their, in their assumptions, which which we think is is uh, a very nice touch for the solution as well. Uh, and uh, we think that one of the, the most interesting aspects of their solution was the visualization created by the uh, computer simulation that they showed us. Uh, and they also calculated the, the critical density from the com computer simulations. Okay, so uh, I would like to uh, discuss some of the advantages and improvements we would like to propose for the solution. First of all, uh, I've covered most of these. Uh, the the uh, From the theoretical standpoint, we think that the probabilistic model was a pretty good model to analyze what's happening uh, in the ball impact. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, they considered a, a very, um, well, they considered the, ki the kinematic uh, description of what happens with the balls after an initial bounce, uh, which is, of course, very important to analyze uh, the nature of the process. Um, they, uh, use, uh, as I said before, they used the rolling condition, which is a kind of also uh, uh, related to the energy loss condition that we consider to be uh, important for the critical density behavior. Um, and in, in terms of these, uh, there was no experimental data, but in terms of the simulation, uh, we believe that the basis that they proposed for uh, the visualization of the microscopic dynamics was pretty good, and that we could uh, visualize it properly, um, as well as well showing us the, that precisely that visualization. Um, and they gave us some parameters to improve precisely this simulation. Um, there are some improvements, which I would like to discuss later on. Um, uh, we would, I, I think we would be, it would be good if we could include more trap-trap interactions because I'm gonna show it uh, uh, in the discussion, in the video, we see a very strong importance of this interaction in the, uh, in the uh, dynamics, um, that a bias in the outgoing direction, it, we think it shouldn't be necessarily a marginal improvement, but rather a central aspect of the simulation um, because it, it's observed that it, uh, well, in experimental observations and the individuals stated by problem that it is a very important aspect there. Uh, the independence of the of, of the launches could be very, uh, well improved upon. Um, and in terms of experimental and simulation, we would like uh, we think that an, a just an experimental justification of the distributions stated would be a pretty nice touch there. Um, well, the threshold was verified by simulation, but we would like to see a contrast between the theoretical analysis and the, and the uh, simulation analysis. Um, and uh, as, as I said before, there is a bias uh, present in the videos. And um, 
And yes, uh, and that, well, that also affects the macroscopic dynamics that were simulated there. Uh, and here are the points I would like to discuss next. Uh, uh, the trap-trap interaction. Um, as you said before, I would like to show a bit of the video that I was referencing before, which is here. If we see uh, the interaction, um, here the balls haven't bounced back yet. And, that, I, and I think that it's a pretty interesting phenomenon because even if the ball hasn't bounced back down, there isn't just a single trap that is being activated, but there is a chain of traps that is activated over there. Um, so I, I would like to ask if, uh, how, how would we uh, include this in the model? Because, well, I, I believe that your approach is, is pretty interesting and we have some interesting visualizations. Uh, so in order to build upon that, uh, how would this affect the vis microscopic visualization of the phenomenon? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a very interesting question. And I suppose implicitly in our simulations, we, um, or in our model, we assume the mousetraps to be stuck down. But you're right, in the video, they're not. Um, and as such, um, I would begin by implementing trap-to-trap -trap interactions um, by basically introducing them as balls that have a much higher energy loss coefficient um, with a much lower in the initial launch velocity. Um, and I think that could be sufficient to accurately model how these would, or perhaps they don't even bounce, right? So that they just immediately um, stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, in terms of the visualization, do you think that that would affect the overall distribution? Or uh, well, we, we saw that in your in your uh, in your simulation, we had like an outgoing flux that was kind of isotropic, which was pretty interesting. Um, how do you think, like uh, qualitatively, that would affect that? Um, I think that the amount of balls launched close to a mousetrap would be increased. Um, and so essentially, yeah, so essentially one mousetrap, one ball hitting a mousetrap would have a probability of triggering mousetraps around it as such, right? And, um, I suppose this can expand outwards as well, but I think probably with a, a lower velocity than the ones that are launched with the balls, um, because these, um, have a much higher launch velocity, um, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that, I think. Uh, and it would be interesting to visualize it as well. Um, another point that I think would be interesting in order to like enrich the physical discussion of what's going on is that, uh, well, we have uh, in your model different points that either have uh, like a one or a zero, given that they're activated or not. Um, and if we're thinking in terms of probabilities, well, we could think of it as a probability assigned to a given point in space. Um, do you think of if, if we modeled it as a field, uh, it, it would be an appropriate or an interesting uh, way to analyze the, the phenomenon rather than uh, if, if, yeah, if we kind of switched approaches, uh, what would you think of that? I, th I think a field equation would be an interesting approach indeed. Um, so essentially we'd be moving from a discrete distribution to a continuous distribution, if I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'm thinking is um, if you mean to say that you could describe the propagation of say this this front that we see as a as a wave of sorts. Um, I don't know if this would be appropriate. Um, so I don't know if if yeah. Um, I, I think it's certainly an interesting approach. Um, in our um, model, obviously we did not consider it. Um, but I think a field equation could be a good. But at the same time, I, I think if, um, there could be some limitations as well because here we're also implicitly making a lot more assumptions. Um, that, um, for instance, that the mouse traps are very small is one of some, or that the mouse trap grid is very small to the launch velocity um, or the travel distance. Um, that's yeah, well, an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, and, and I think it would be, um, I think it fits nicely into your model because if, uh, as, uh, as we discussed before, the, the excitations well, kind of seem to kind of propagate as wave. And uh, if we could somehow like see it as a probability wave that's expanding, um, I think that it, that uh, inclu including that in your model could be an interesting visualization of that as well. Um, okay, I, I think uh, we covered this a bit in, in your uh, presentation, and I want to go a bit outside the box. So uh, let's see. Uh, we could we could see this uh, first. Um, for example, precisely in the video that I was showing, um, something interesting. Sorry, I stopped sharing the screen. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. We can see that uh, here. Um, they are enclosed in a box. 
and that kind of changes a bit the dynamics of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so if uh, if in your model you somehow included different boundary conditions, uh, do you think how how do you think that would affect the model in general? Um, I would actually I'll like to can join now. Sorry, just letting. Yep. Okay. Um, I I just like to respond to that first by saying that we did actually implement the walls. Um, I don't know. Perhaps you missed it at the end because um, I ran a bit out of time. Um, okay. But I did implement the walls, and it was actually interesting to see because with um, obviously without walls, you have a large probability that if mouse traps are launched far, that they actually leave the area, right? Whereas if they're not, if they're reflected, then they um, can actually bounce back in. And one one critical thing that we noticed is that you did not like um, you can actually see this on our simulations. I could show you if you want. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, quickly share the screen. Um, so I'd have to go back here. So here, this is without, and you can see that there's whites around the edges. So these are, there's more mouse traps that are untriggered around the edges because there's no probability that they're hit from the other side effectively, right? Yeah. Whereas here, we had these two extensions. Also, I'd like to point out that we did actually have a, an implementation for the velocity bias. I think you mentioned that in your presentation. Um, yeah, yeah. And here we have the reflecting walls. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to it. It was a bit of a shame. But um, here you can actually see that the edges are no longer uh, white. And there's an increase in the critical density uh, or the critical separation because the balls can bounce back in. Um, so essentially, uh, yeah, um, I think that would be the effect. There's no edge of untriggered mouse traps, and there's a slightly higher critical density. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I missed that. I'm sorry about that. And I was persistent. It's okay, it was very fast at the end. So, uh, yeah, and I, and I think it's pretty interesting because that's what one would expect, like intuitively, if we have a greater number of balls bouncing back in and not just going outwards, then uh, perhaps the density needn't be so. To some extent, you can consider it similar to an infinite field, but the only difference being that they bounce back into the same square. So, I think yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting indeed. So, um. Yeah. Please. So, great. Uh, how about we, we discuss a bit of what applications we could use this type of phenomenon in? Uh, like, for example, if, if I were to say, uh, not necessarily like mundane, but uh, also scientific applications, uh, what could this type of analysis be used in? Oh, okay. Um, well, there's multiple. And I think, first of all, um, COVID was one big one, because you can use this, perhaps uh, some models like this to model the... Um, the spread of diseases. Um, that would be one approach. Um, another thing is, I guess, as the name suggests, nuclear mousetraps, uh, right? So there you also, in nuclear reactors, you also have these chain reactions. So there you also would want to know what the critical density is that you need to have a, a sustained chain reaction that does neither explode nor um, cease because you want to produce power. Um, so I think those two are the examples that would come to mind for me. I might okay. add, um... Possibly you could also deter, um, simulate social phenomena because maybe opinion switches where um, people can convince each other of certain things and what they need to propagate throughout the population. Well, that, that, that's actually pretty interesting. Um, well, I'm an economist, so I, I believe that that is a great addition to what we can analyze here. Um, so great. Uh, how about we, uh, uh, I, I have another uh, question that could be interesting to see how that would affect the um, the analysis of the phenomenon. So say we have an array where we have a central mousetrap, mouse trap, and then the other ones are, are, array, um, are kind of uh, arranged triangularly around it with increasing sizes. Um, do you think that would affect the, the type of wave that's going outwards in, ter in terms of probability? Could you maybe explain how exactly you mean this grid? So if you mean this mousetraps increase in size, do you also mean that they have a higher initial launch velocity? Or? Um, no, no the, the triangles in which they are arranged in, increase ah, in size. Okay. So they're like concentric, yeah. Um, okay, uh, I, guess it, I guess it depends on which side you launch from, right? Because I would say if you launch from the side that is, um, sorry, one more clarification. If you say arranged in a triangle, are they still point? Okay, I, I guess we're assuming that they are um, don't have a velocity bias at this point, right? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. Simple, um, um, yeah. Essentially, what I would expect is if you trigger it from the high density area, I would expect that the wave would propagate, but then eventually the R number would drop below one and it would cease. Um, and I think I could also expect the 
a higher velocity initially and then a decreased velocity later on. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt in this few seconds. I want to ask um, what happened with your experimental data because all I'm seeing here is some theoretical models and simulations. So did you actually do some experimental data to actually back the results that you got in your simulations? Uh, unfortunately not, no. Um, yeah, um, so we considered doing experiments, but it didn't exactly work with time constraints. Um, so especially because if you consider these, these would be Monte Carlo experiments, right? Probably with one mouse trap to determine these parameters. Um, and right. I think the convergence of Monte Carlo experiments is quite low, uh, one over root n. Um, so, uh, as I understand, you consider uh, the case when a mouse trip uh, supply energy only to a ball which was initially uh, initially placed in it but doesn't uh, increase uh, energy of the ball which uh, heated from outside. Uh, if I understand uh, right, so uh, what do you think? Uh, is it really the experimental situation? And uh, shouldn't you consider the uh, increasing the energy of uh, all balls? Um, so, so in this case, if I um, understand this correctly, you mean to say that a ball hitting a mouse trap would also transfer energy from the ball that hit it to the ball that's launched? Or yes, a mouse trap will supply energy to two balls, not only to a ball which is, was initially in it, but okay. also to a ball which uh, hit it. Okay, that's a, an interesting, an interesting point. Um, in this case, in the model, uh, one of our assumptions was that this did not happen. Um, and I think I mentioned that explicitly in the beginning, but you're right. I think in, in real life, um, this would be an important consideration. So we could perhaps add an additional energy um, that is added. Um, the problem is, I guess for me, is that it, I don't think the mousetrap, so a mousetrap can technically be triggered by a ball without adding energy. That probability also exists. Um, and I think it's a real probability, like probably 50% or so, right? Um, so in, in our simulation and in our model, we decided to ignore it, um, but it certainly is a relevant point. I agree. Okay, now Vladimir, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for an uh, interesting report. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, did you somehow try to describe the uh, probability uh, dynamics spatial temporal uh, as uh, some equation, for example, uh, what is uh, okay? Um, how does this wave of excitation go through space with which uh, velocity and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you could try to uh, even to build some equations that describe uh, its dynamics? Did you try something like this? Um, regarding the velocity, um, we did actually attempt to construct a. Um, to determine the velocity from the simulation. Um, unfortunately, we weren't successful um, because basically um, what we wanted to do, our approach was to take many simulations and basically average the pro, um, the mousetrip, um, the, whether they're triggered or not, the grid. Um, and we wanted to use this to determine where um, it surpasses a threshold and then determine how this propagates through time. Um, but we didn't. Um, end up managing to do this. And the second idea that you mentioned was the, I think the field equation. Um, uh, it was like this, yeah, but if this one of the question of a problem, uh, spatial temporal dynamics mm -hmm. of probability. Uh, okay, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, now I'm out here, you can go ahead. Yes, all right. So uh, during the opposition, one of the things that was brought up was, was a trap-trap interaction. And that was brought up as a, a huge thing that should be considered if you want to model the experiment correctly. So a uh, question for the reporter and then same for the opponent. Uh, do you think that if we add this interaction, we have all the required elements to actually have a model that simulates the experiment? Or do you think we're still missing key components to have the same results as in the experiments. Okay. Um, 
I think um, at least an, as a first order approximation, we would have all the all the um, parameters. Um, but I do think that there are other factors that play a role, like as mentioned, this um, bowl to bowl um, energy transfer or, or the energy added to the um, so for instance, there's, there's multiple things, right? There's the bolt to -bolt interactions in the air, which we haven't considered. Um, and there's also the fact that mouse traps can add energy to balls that hit them. Um, and All yes, right. does the opponent have anything to add? Um, I, I, I think it would be very much uh, a pretty similar answer to what the reporter said. Uh, as a first order approximation, uh, we believe that mouse, uh, that ball trap interactions and trap trap interactions are the main significant factors. Uh, of course, as they say, like ball collisions in the air and air resistance are factors that could be considered, by, but uh, at least from what we estimated, they would be something of the order of three orders of magnitude smaller than the factors that are playing here. So okay. I believe that yes, that, that would be enough. Thank you. And, and I would like to add something real quick. Maybe it would be important to uh, create a distribution experimentally of the initial parameters, such as the initial velocity and the, and the launch angle. So I think that would be also important and that could be done with simply just one mousetrap as well. All right, Boba, you want to ask one yeah. of my questions? Okay, okay a short question. Uh, uh, what was your uh, time discretization step? The question I ask, uh, uh, that's because, uh, uh, for example, a ball which is launched practically vertically will hit the ground or the other mouth traps after a much longer time when, when a ball uh, that uh, is flying practically horizontally. So did you somehow include this into the model? Is the question to the reporter. Um, okay. Um, unfortunately, no, we did not include this. Um, in our assumptions, we had that the angle distribution was very small. So um, in our, in our um, yeah, we don't have any experiments to back this up, but um, we had a standard deviation of, uh, I think, 0.1 um, radians. And if you compute 0.1 radians, the cosine of this is a 90. So, uh, your, time, your time discretization was between the balls uh, hitting the ground. Uh, exactly. So basically what we assumed is all the balls that are launched in one time step hit the ground in the next time step. Yeah, That's but uh, also even if uh, the ball all the time uh, throws, is flying practically vertically, then after several hits, it loses partly his energy and also this time beca becomes lower and lower. That's a that's a good point. That's a good point. Okay, um, thank you. Wasn't included in the model. Okay, thank, okay you. thank you for the questions. Now the jury, the juries uh, have 